Welcome everyone to our first Topic Tuesday of the fall 2021 semester. We're excited to have you guys joining us again for this in informational webinar. We've got a great um, presenter today from the College Board that's going to share all the great information resources that you need to know um, on the College Board and all the things that are involved with that. So as we get started today, um, we have a fun introductory poll, but we've got some reminders as far as the webinar mode. As I'm sure you're aware, um, we cannot see or hear you, but we still want to interact with you. So you'll see at the bottom, you have a few options, one of which is the chat box. If you have any technical issues or direct um, issues that you want to talk with the panelists about the platform, please use that. Um, there's also the feature of Q&A. This is where we ask that you put your questions. All the panelists will be able to see that and we'll be able to address those questions for the presenter um, along the way. So those are the features and you can raise your hand um, if you have a specific question or need technical issues and we will reach out to you. So um, one other thing that we wanted to do before we get started as our friends are joining us is to do a, a little introductory poll. So we've got a fun acronym as there's a lot of those within higher education. And so we wanted to see, do you know what does the PSAT stand for? So I'm gonna launch that poll for everybody to see. So if you will pick what you believe the PSAT stands for, we'll give everyone a few minutes to answer that. So if you're just joining us, um, we have a fun little welcome poll um, intro activity to see if your knowledge base on what the PSAT stands for. We've got three options, getting some responses coming in and we will share that. We're gonna talk about um, our guest speaker in just a second and they are going to share all of their knowledge um, about College Board as well as resources and the PSAT is definitely one of those. All right, so give it a few more seconds and um, we'll wrap it up about a minute. So you got about 10 more seconds. If you haven't answered the poll, go ahead and do so. All right, last call for responses. Okay, so share the results out. So um, our options were provisional SAT, preliminary scholastic assessment test and preparatory SAT. So the PSAT stands for the preliminary scholastic assessment test. And so we are going to um, learn more about that today, but we wanted to have a fun little acronym um, game as we do our introduction. I'm gonna hand it now over to our um, guide throughout today, Shannon Grimsley. All right, good morning and welcome to the webinar. I'm Shannon Grimsley, the Director of State Outreach for the Woodward Hines Education Foundation and the Gift College Program. We are recording today's session and we'll send a link to anyone who is registered. For those watching the recording, today's date is August 31st, 2021, and the material in this webinar is current through the 2021-2022 school year. In today's session, all about the College Board and PSAT, you'll hear from a College Board representative who will give you lots of great information about the, the PSAT process and about College Board's resources for your students. I will now share a little background on Get to College and a few logistics about the webinar before we get started. Get to College is a nonprofit program of the Woodward Hines Education Foundation. We have three centers in Mississippi, one in, in Jackson, one in Ocean Springs and South Haven. And we help parents, students, and high school counselors with all aspects of the college planning and financial aid process. And best of all, all of our services are completely free. In our centers, we offer personalized college counseling appointments where we can tell students when to apply for admission and scholarships, help fill out the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, or advise on essay writing and interviewing. During the webinar, as a reminder, we cannot see or hear you, but you can ask us questions through the chat or through the Q&A at any time if you have questions for the presenter. Today's agenda, uh, we're having our introduction now, and then we will uh, hear from our guest presenter from the College Board, 
After that, we'll address any questions that you might have and have a Q&A session. And then we'll um, discuss upcoming webinars and professional development opportunities and give you our contact information. So our co-hosts today are myself, uh, Shannon Grimsley, and I'm the Outreach Program Director at Gitta College, and Kirsten Dufour, who you heard from earlier, and she will be replying to your Q&A today and will be monitoring the chat. As I said, we will have time for live Q&A with presenters at the end, but feel free to message your questions at any time. I would now like to introduce our speaker for the day. Our speaker for the day is Kale Golden. Kale Golden is a Senior Director of State and District Partnerships with the College Board, where he is entering his eighth year and has worked with Mississippi Districts and MDE since taking the position. After over 13 years of teaching, including both AP English Language and Literature, he came to the College Board in an effort to support the mission of increasing access for all students towards college and career readiness. He's been a passionate advocate for students throughout the Southern region, particularly in providing opportunities for first generation or underrepresented groups. Having been a first generation college student himself from a rural area, Kale truly believes that access to advanced coursework can help change a student's life and is most proud of his work in Mississippi to help develop the state AP credit policy. We are so glad to have you here today, Kale. Um, and I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Kale. And um, Kale, you can begin your um, presentation screen sharing now. All right, well, thank you so much for the introduction. And I am thrilled to be here uh, with you. Uh, as Shannon shared, uh, my name is Kale. I uh, am with the College Board um, with uh, State and District Partnerships which truly just means uh, that I'm your, your, your guy for all things College Board. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you today. I'm gonna speak directly about uh, the PSAT because um, I know that you guys had a lot of questions. I do uh, really appreciate an informal session. So if you guys have questions, please send those through so that, that I can answer them and make this session exactly what for, you need for it to be. Um, and again, uh, if something comes up and I need to stop for the good of the group, I'm happy to to answer throughout. Otherwise, we'll have a Q&A at the end of our session. So I first wanted to acknowledge, um, I just want to make sure can you, you can see my, my screen, um, Shannon, just to be sure. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, so I first wanted to acknowledge, I know that this has been a crazy couple of years uh, for those of us who've uh, who've uh, been in, in public education uh, or, or private education for that matter. This has been just a wild couple of years. Uh, so I know that, first of all, a huge thank you to you guys. I know that you, uh, particularly as counselors, are getting new questions all the time and, and being asked things that that uh, change every day. And so I really appreciate all the good work that you're doing for your students. Uh, my goal today is really just to give you some actionable steps and just and some updated information for you to share with parents. If I don't know an answer for you, I'm happy to come back to you and share that. You will get a present uh, a copy of the presentation um, as well as the, a copy of the recording. So uh, there will be some slides that I may go through a little quicker, but you will get a copy so you'll be able to to follow up in that way. But again, just a huge thank you for everything that you do for students. Um, I, I can't say thank you enough. Um, just before we get started, I always like to share uh, the College Board mission statement. As, as Shannon shared, we are a, a nonprofit and our goal is truly about opening access and equity for all students to be sure that, that kids have the opportunities available to them. Uh, that means that for programs like Advanced Placement, or the PSAT that kids uh, know what's available to them. And, and a big part of that comes from sharing the information with uh, the adults. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll learn some things today and there's some information that I can share with you. Um, I really wanted to set up uh, our conversation different um, differently today. Uh, yesterday uh, I shared, some of you may have been a part of our national um, uh, counselor workshops that we have every fall. So I want to make sure to share some different information with you. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat so that you can uh, 
check that out. I, I did a specific for Mississippi workshop yesterday. I know you guys were dealing with weather, uh, so some of you may not have attended and, and wanted to, uh, but it's more of an update of all things College Board uh, for the fall and just for the upcoming year. You can, you can check out that link. Um, it is recorded uh, from yesterday. But today I really want to approach the conversation around the PSAT a little differently um, and, and, and talk about the ways that we can add opportunities for our kids and really open up that access uh, that is something that I think we're all uh, pretty passionate about. Now, a big part of that is going to be about identifying those opportunities. You have to know what the opportunities are so that you can offer them to kids and then really support the access. And that's going to be where the mindset uh, change happens. Um, and then we'll talk about advancing success. And that is about what the, the reasons why your kids would participate in the PSAT. Uh, I have a, a sneaking suspicion. I know why most of your kids are participating, but I want to talk that through a little bit because I think that uh, there may be some opportunities available that you may not know about, and I want to be sure to, to share that information with you. So again, if you have questions throughout, please, please, please don't hesitate to send, uh, send that through to the Q&A. So first, let's talk about um, identifying some of the opportunities. And, and really, this, this to me um, is about using the tools that you have. And as a former English teacher, uh, I'm going to say a word that's often scary to, to, to my people, and that's around data. But using the data to sort of check out where we are, even if you don't like what the data says, uh, I, you have to have sort of an approach of like, it is what it is. And then you have an opportunity to, to make change and educate and involve all the stakeholders as needed. So I'm going to share with you guys some specific Mississippi data and we'll talk about what story it tells us. Uh, we'll also talk about what what we uh, you know can and can't see from that data, um, and 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 then talk about what the opportunities are. Uh, there are, there are a couple of specifics that I'm going to talk about um, that I see from the data, but I, I do encourage you to have this conversation within your school and within your district, uh, even if it's a hard conversation to have. So first off, um, I wanted to share this uh, this uh, slide shares with you AP participation and performance. And so for me, on the left, you see all of the, the, the locations that uh, where AP um, percentages of 12th graders who took an AP exam before they left high school. So anything that is red uh, represents less than 1% of high school students took an AP exam. Um, if we look at the right, that's looking at uh, the performance. So the red represents uh, the, the percentage of 12th graders who scored a three or higher uh, on an AP exam. And this looks at the cohort of the class of 2020. So that's the, the most recent data that I have. So for me, in looking at this, uh, while the right, uh, the right uh, map is really, really important, I start with the left side and really say, there's an opportunity uh, for students who don't, uh, who don't get to experience the AP classes. And I know a few years ago, the acceleration model in your accountability, excuse me, the acceleration piece in your accountability model encourages uh, um, that. I also know that there are some pockets of dual enrollment. There's, uh, I, I believe, a district that, that offers Cambridge. Um, there are some IB districts in there. So it, it doesn't tell a complete story, but it does share that there are some places where kids don't have the access for advanced uh, courses. And then on the right, I would say one of the things that, that, uh, that when we're looking at performance, uh, do the do the, the schools have the resources that they need? So I'll speak a little bit about AP uh, interspler, interspliced uh, with our conversation today around PSAT and talk to you about some of those resources that will help support kids and their performance um, as well. So moving on to some more data, this just looks at the what we call the SAT suite of assessments. These are all of the, the percentages of kids who participate uh, across all of our assessments. And that starts with the uh, PSAT 89 and goes all the way through the SAT. So when we look at this, obviously, the largest percentages of your students participate in the class of 2020, uh, excuse me, in their junior year, as well as their senior year. So when we're looking at this data, about 15% of your juniors participate in the PSAT uh, in MSQT, and about 11% participate in the PSAT um, in your 10th grade classes. So again, there's some opportunity for students um, that, that still exist, and hopefully when we talk about the why, uh, that will, will encourage you uh, to make the opportunity available for, for some of your students. Now, 
speaking of the 11th grade, one of the things that I like to dig down and, and make sure when we look at the participation to see if the data does it match what our what our population looks like. So what I've gone and, and taken is your FTE count as a state to see if, if the participation uh, in the PSAT matches what the percentage of, of that population looks like in your state. And right out of the gate, uh, the, the, the thing that I can see is that um, there is a, a disproportionate number of students that uh, for Black or African American students 40, who represent 47.7% of population in, in Mississippi, uh, and only about 15.1% of juniors who take the PSAT uh, or are Black or African American. Uh, conversely, uh, there's about 43.7% of students in the, uh, the state that are white, uh, but about 64.2% of participants are um, uh, are white on the PSAT. Um, and that's just important to know. It just is what it is to share that information. It may be uh, about information getting out there. A lot of our underrepresented students uh, come from come from families where they might be first generation. Um, the other thing that I would note is uh, around the no response. Uh, that means uh, that students did not share their 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 information with us about what their race or ethnicity is, and that's totally fine. Although I'm going to talk about a few of the opportunities that speak to uh, students who are um, particular ethnicities and or locations. So there are some opportunities for you to share that with kids um, about things that are available to them. You have this data that also represents what your school looks like. So I would encourage you guys to check out uh, to see if your data for your school matches your participation. Now, this is something that, that I am super, super, super passionate about. And if you've ever been in a session with me, which I recognize some of your names, I know that, that we have been together. One of the things that's really, really important to me is that um, knowing about the fee waiver opportunity for students. Um, so uh, just to give you a little bit of context, about 75% of students, that's three out of four kids in Mississippi are eligible for free or reduced lunch. Um, and that means that they meet the qualifications by the federal government. I know that, that federally everybody's getting free lunch right now, but about three out of four kids are eligible for that. That's important for me to share with you because those students qualify to take the PSAT and MSQT as 11th graders for free. 11th graders, PSAT and MSQT for free for students who qualify for free or reduced lunch or who meet the, the eligibility. About 16%, as I shared earlier, of juniors in the class of 2020 participated in the PSAT as juniors. Um, and about 5% of those students were uh, took it using a fee waiver. That means that there's a huge gap of students who are eligible to take the PSAT for free and those uh, students who uh, who actually used a fee waiver on the, um, the PSAT. Now I'm sharing that with you as counselors um, and as possibly the PSAT coordinators because this is a huge opportunity for you guys uh, to share uh, with your students and tell them what it, they are eligible for. I know a lot of you, uh, your students participate in the PSAT for national merit, um, and, and, and that's great for, for those kids that qualify for that, but there are a lot of other opportunities we're going to talk about in a few minutes, but the first of which is that you have a large population of students who would be eligible to take it for free, and that can only be requested and indicated by the adult, the person who orders the exams. You are the only person who can make that possible for students. So making sure that you're aware of the opportunity so that you can then pass that along to students. I'm happy to talk about that a little bit later if you want to understand the how, but this is just the data. It just is what it is, um, and I wanted to make you aware of that. So. Once we've once looking at the data and talking about those opportunities that are out there, I really like to then move on to uh, supporting the accesses there. And, and that's that making sure that you're familiar with what is available and to which students, and then making sure that that information gets to them, um, uh, increasing your um, awareness and knowledge, but also increasing uh, that for students. I'll say the other thing is about shifting that mindset uh, and helping to create policies that are supportive of all uh, students. So um, that's something that that really has to happen. It, it can happen on a um, 
on a state level as your AP credit policy did, uh, which is a really fantastic thing that does not exist in every state. Uh, but it also can happen at your school level. Maybe you open up the PSAT and MSQT only to the kids who, uh, who choose to take it, or maybe to the kids only who uh, scored a certain threshold on uh, the PSAT as a 10th grader. Whatever it is, making sure that your, your policies are uh, hope uh, are open for kids and encouraging all students to participate. Now, um, I mentioned this earlier, making sure that, that who is eligible for fee waiver benefits, making sure that your kids are, are aware of who is eligible. Um, if they meet any of these qualifications, um, then they are eligible, again, to take the PSAT and MSQT for free. And that's something that, that uh, I, I, I hope that you'll make available to your students and not just for those who uh, meet a certain threshold. Um, and, and make sure that it's important to them. This could be a, a game changer for them um, in talking about their college and career readiness. Um, I also included this, and I'll share this with you guys when you get into uh, when you get your your pot, your copy of this presentation later. These are all of the reasons why a kid would want to participate uh, using the PSAT and MSQT uh, and the SAT fee waivers. There are a lot of resources that are free to them. Things like. Uh, the uh, free college applications, unlimited score sends, uh, the CSS profile, which I know my friends at Get to College are, are huge supporters of helping everybody complete the FAFSA. Well, the profile is a is a fantastic resource uh, that that is connected uh, with helping students find institutional funds. If they use a fee waiver for the PSAT or SAT, then they get the profile for free. Um, they also, we waive late registration fees um, and score verification reports for students. So there are a lot of reasons why you would want to make sure that kids that uh, get the opportunity to participate that are not necessarily related to national merit. Um, uh, again, um, I'll share this handout with you so that you're able to have that as well. Um, and there is also a really useful counselor guide uh, that is, uh, will, will clarify for you uh, fee waivers and fee reductions and how to identify those students. Um, Connected to that, in the, the session that I recorded yesterday for Mississippi teachers, uh, excuse me, counselors, um, there is a lot of these resources are in there, and I, I talk about uh, fee waivers a great deal. So you might want to join if you'd like more information on that. So really quickly, um, I just wanted to share with you a lot of the reasons why uh, the PSAT uh, and the suite of assessments as a whole, why your kids would want to participate. And this is a slide that I, I share with you uh, uh, that is really around supporting the access for kids, making sure that they know about all of these reasons. Our kids do know that that national merit is out there and they do know uh, maybe that that Khan Academy is a piece of it, but making sure that you share all of this with them. So feel free to utilize this slide and share it with them. Um, I'm just going to start and just share with you just a really high level view. Um, when we talk about alignment, what we're speaking about is, is what the content of the, the, uh, the SAT and the PSAT itself. Um, I, there's, there's a lot of places where I visit where people still believe that the content is, is uh, outside of what kids do in the classroom or somehow only appropriate for kids who are going off to the Ivy League schools, and, th and that's just not the case. Uh, the alignment really reflects what's happening in classrooms. We ad uh, adapted uh, the, uh, the suite to match what's happening in schools rather than asking schools to match what's happening on the test. Uh, and that is a really, you know, that's one of those, those fundamental pieces of education, making sure that kids um, uh, are, are they're their work is being reflected on the assessment. Um, it allows for you to have a readiness uh, check-in um, to establish a baseline, but then have constant check-ins to see how students are performing on, uh, towards college readiness. Um, practice with the Khan Academy, I could talk about this all day. When kids connect their scores to Khan Academy, it gives them personalized practice on the things that they need to be doing. And that's really, really important um, that so that kids are not just sitting in the class and the teachers throwing out information and hopefully it sticks to the right kids uh, for what they need. Um, it really gives that tailored approach. And the more they practice, the more personalized it becomes. Um, you're able to see growth. Our scores are vertically aligned, and, and that allows the students to see where they are if they take it as a ninth grader, but then check in again and see uh, where they are as an 11th grader. So really using it towards uh, towards a growth model. Um, AP Potential, this is something I do a webinar with with the MDE every year. Uh, as counselors, if you guys are making schedules, you're, you're, you have kids who are exploring taking uh, possible advanced courses, 
um, which I know a lot of your kids are. Uh, the AP Potential Report actually identifies the courses where they're most likely to have the success. Um, and it ensures that when you look at your master schedule and you look at the courses that are offered, does that match with what our kids are showing us they're able to do or that they have an interest in doing? So it really helps on a, a lot of different ways, both institutionally and with your kids. Um, we also, um, with our, our assessments, uh, allow students uh, to to opt into student search service, which I know a lot of you are familiar with, uh, which allows colleges and universities to connect with them. Those students are about 12% more likely to attend a four-year university when they're reached out to uh, with college uh, from colleges using student search service. So that's something that I know when I used to administer uh, assessments, our kids uh, would ask, well, why do I need to opt into this? That's one of the reasons. It may be that you fit a certain scholarship like national merit. We can't share their information with you with them, uh, no matter how great your score is, if you don't opt in. So that's something that I, that I really want to um, to uh, reiterate. Uh, there are tons of scholarships. I'm going to talk about a few of them today um, that are connected. Um, and then finally, just overall success in in um, in their higher ed institutions, and really making sure that that. Um, they're not just admitted to colleges, but that their placement and their retention, the things and supports that are needed for them on campus are there so that they can find success uh, as a, a college age student. Now I'm gonna very quickly dig down into each one of those. I, I'm not gonna belabor it because I know you guys will have the presentation, but you can use these slides to talk about uh, with students what it is that they're, um, that they're gonna see uh, by taking advantage of the PSAT. Um, so the alignment and readiness, I mentioned this already. Uh, when we look at those top two places, that's where we, when we talk to kids, we often talk about what your total score is or maybe a breakdown in evidence-based reading and writing. But all of that, that really helpful data that's right below uh, is something that is available to all kids. And that means that for those of us who took a college readiness exam, uh, when we were in high school, we maybe took it and then we decided to retake it for a uh, for uh, an improved score. And uh, basically our method for studying was just prayer uh, and hoping for the best. And that's something that, that I, these kids are able to see, you know, your problem is, is not uh, around necessarily vocabulary. Maybe it's with linear equations. So that's what you need to practice. So the, their score reports are much more robust um, than, than ours would have been. So making sure that the kids understand the scores, not just at these top two levels, but really down below that. And that's gonna, gonna um, be reflected in the reports that they get back. Um, so national merit may be, again, tied to those top levels, or that may be what kids uh, see as their, their uh, sort of their performance uh, index. But all of that information that's below that is gonna allow them to make the changes that get a more improved score. Um, Again, with alignment and readiness, I know that you guys are aware of, of what benchmarks can do and really helping with uh, with kids having that that insight um, into what it is that they need to improve upon. I will um, uh, be working with the, the MDE to set up a session around understanding your scores. I also um, hope that you guys will, will uh, take advantage of the resources that we have online um, about helping kids to understand those scores uh, because uh, the college and re uh, career readiness benchmarks are gonna help students identify where their performance level is. So when we look at how kids are um, performing, these college and career readiness benchmarks for the SAT of 480 in evidence-based reading and writing and 530 in math indicates that their 75% likelihood of a C or better uh, as a, in a freshman level uh, credit bearing course. We have a lot of kids that are leaving our schools who are going and taking um, non credit uh, bearing courses in college, or they're just not prepared for the courses that they're entering. And using these benchmarks is a great way for you to talk them through where their readiness falls. So a conversation that you have with a kid who scores uh, a 410 in the evidence based reading and writing is a different conversation if they're taking the PSAT as an eighth grader, or if they're taking it as an 11th grader. So as counselors, it's really important that that you are utilizing the grade level benchmarks in leading them towards that that college and career readiness benchmark as well. Um, so uh, one of the things that I did want to note that's about supporting opportunities is that uh, there is, um, as you know, there was a change in uh, the diploma options for students, and now students can use their SAT scores uh, to uh, graduate. 
uh, with their diplomas in, the, in, in um, a distinguished academic or an academic endorsement on a traditional diploma. And that's a really, really great change for our students to be able to use the college and career readiness benchmarks. Uh, we have kids who've been taking the ACT and have been scoring the same thing years and years in a row. Um, and maybe it's our, their kids need uh, a different opportunities. So including the SAT as a graduation option is really, really a fantastic uh, change uh, that came from a lot of conversations that were coming from you. We need kids to be able to indicate their readiness in a different way. Uh, so do check that out. That's on the MDE website. So I wanted to make sure to acknowledge it. That is starting with your seniors that are currently in place. Um, one of the great things about, about the scores and utilizing the, the tools that are out there is that, uh, for example, the the I mentioned this already, but the SAT practice, which is reflecting what kids are doing in class, if you link your college, uh, your college board assessment um, scores to Khan Academy, you do it the first time you log in and you say, yep, you can share the metadata, the kids get constant practice on improving. So that means if you have kids that participate in the PSAT early, um, and they're working towards national merit as an 11th grader say, if you introduce them to the Khan Academy practice where they're going to have real SAT questions and they're going to have the real experience of uh, what is it that I need to work on um, by getting their results, they're going to improve their score as an 11th grader and have a greater opportunity to qualify for national merit or some of our other scholarship programs. Um, even if they don't have a college board assessment uh, as a younger student, there are some um, resources on the uh, official SAT practice webpage uh, that allow the kids to take a diagnostic quiz and then go ahead and start practicing um, based on what their performance was on those diagnostic quizzes. I cannot say enough uh, good things about this, um, this resource. Please, please, please check it out, satpractice.org. That's some place that you can go and I would encourage you to check it out um, uh, before sending your students there. Um, and the data backs it up. I mean, we see, we've seen the students growth. Uh, they have increased with at least six hours or higher, a 39 point increase on average. And that is that is when we see students that start getting a higher score, that's something that that may actually change where they're they're um, accepted to college, how, what classes they're placed into, whether or not they have to uh, take a remedial course uh, when they get to the college campus. So really making sure that that the kids are um, both um, following the guidelines of, of Khan Academy, that they're using the, the opportunity to practice and level up, that they are participating in the full length practices. One of the great things about Khan Academy is it, it sort of builds the kids readiness and, and it gives them little short chunks of about 15 minute practice, but then we'll say, okay, you're ready to practice a full exam. That's a really important experience for some of our kids to have. So uh, do again, check it out. The data speaks for itself. Are, are, the kids are performing better uh, if they're having that that practice. Um, and then determining the, the coursework, I mentioned this earlier, hopefully you guys are, are already familiar with AP Potential. You have it. This is a report that you have uh, for your building. If you have any kids that participate in AP Potential, or excuse me, in the PSAT or the SAT or the PSAT 89, you have this report available to you. It's very, very um, fast to run it. Again, I, I did a session with the MDE. I, I'll be happy to do another one this year. Uh, your student may have received a, a letter from uh, your superintendent, uh, Carrie Wright, who sent letters to all kids who showed potential in some AP courses. That comes from the AP potential report, which is just a, this kid has likelihood of doing well in this AP course. So you may get questions about courses that kids uh, are showing uh, strength in, but that you don't often uh, offer at your campus currently. There are 24 uh, AP courses where you see readiness uh, scores, including computer science principles, which I know is something that is really important uh, expansion opportunity for your kids. You can see that report that's there. We also, um, just so that you are aware, in the student report, we also share that with the kids. So for you as counselors, I really wanna highlight this um, as a resource for you. The kid can go in, they go into their AP potential report on, on their student side, they can identify what their um, intended major is, and then they will see three things. One, do you show potential in that course? So a listing of all of the courses where we have the data. Do you show potential in the course? Does your school currently offer that course? And finally, does it match the major that you've indicated? So that's a really great way for kids to think about what their, their um, 
course pathway is going to be uh, through high school. Do I need this course and does it match what I'm intending to do or am I just taking a course at random? So know that this report goes both to you at the school level and to the student level as well. Um, again, uh, there are 38 courses that are offered. I would encourage you to check them out. A lot of people don't know that there are 38 full AP courses. Um, uh, just looking at your courses and taking an inventory, are you offering calculus because that's always what you've offered on your, ca your campus? Um, do you have kids that are showing statistics uh, uh, preparation? Are you offering AP English literature, uh, but you have a conflicting uh, dual enrollment class, and so it never makes? Maybe a, a English Lang is a, is a course that you might offer on your campus. So it can make a lot of decisions for you. Um, are our kids interested in even taking these courses? So check out all of the 38 courses. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with them. Uh, but what we see every year um, across the state is generally the same top 10 courses are being offered. Um, you may see the same thing on your campuses, but, but that's something that I would encourage you to make sure that you know the opportunities that are out there. Um, I mentioned this earlier um, as, a, as a resource and especially around the performance. This is, this is a critical, critical thing for your schools to know. Um, AP courses, uh, one of the things that, that as, you, as you open the opportunity through your acceleration piece of the accountability model, um, there were teachers who said, you know, this kid's just not AP ready yet. And so what we developed are resources that are every school is, av is available to them for free um, that are they're online. As soon as we went into lockdown in March, 2020, all of your AP kids that were online could immediately pivot to online learning because they were already registered in, in AP classroom. Um, and uh, this is a way for the kids to practice. You have all of the, there are unit guides that guide teachers into what's most important for kids to know. Uh, there are daily videos that allow kids to see all of the content and skills that's being asked for them in an AP course. And then there's practice that, that, range from, that ranges from just a, a really basic, do you understand this, this topic um, into uh, unit checks that are personal progress checks where kids not only see their results but also receive their 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 feedback to say well this is why what you said was wrong and and this is why what you should have chosen was right so it gives the kids the opportunity to learn from that assessment and see their progress along the way as well as for the for the teachers to to share with them uh, real ap questions for the kids to practice now, these resources are available to all kids, and I also know a lot, uh, that almost all of your kids in the state, if not all of your kids, got op uh, had the opportunity for um, digital resources uh, that would allow them to access this. So if you have a AP programs at your school, it's really important that your teachers are using AP Classroom. I cannot say enough good things about this. This is going to impact your students' performance as well as your performance as a school and across the state. So I, we'll for sure be doing webinars around this with the MDE, but make sure that, that you are asking your AP teachers about this in your building. Also, if you aren't offering an AP course because you've been, you've been scared to offer something, the resources are there. So this allows you to impact kids who necessarily didn't seem ready. So when you look at that AP potential report, you're showing a lot of kids in psychology who might do well, then these are the resources that are going to support them through that course. Um, now, I, I mentioned a couple of times already, but I just have to give a shout out that Mississippi has an exemplary um, consistent AP credit policy. And that comes from our friends at the MDE uh, and IHL who got together and decided what was going to be best for kids. And that means that all of your campuses in, in Mississippi, um, uh, all of your, your public universities and, 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 and uh, colleges, as well as your community colleges, are offering AP credit uh, for a three or higher. And that's huge uh, for, for all of your kids. It's an opportunity that, that just they know that if they pass the course, they're going to get college credit. That's a huge, huge, huge win for the kids of Mississippi. And this has been in place for a couple of years. So I'm reiterating that to you. You can find uh, the AP credit policy on the MDE AP page. Um, so do check that out. It really is, I say exemplary because we share it with other states who are considering. Um, I, I work with the state of Georgia. They have not yet uh, instituted an AP credit policy and we absolutely share the Mississippi credit policy as a guide for this is how it's done. And this is what's good for kids. And so making sure that your kids are aware of this and that encourages them further to do well in their AP courses because they're gonna get credit. 
Um, just a few things that I want to note uh, around AP while I'm here, um, and those are some changes that have happened. There is AP funding in place uh, for uh, courses, curriculum, training, and exam cost for AP. Make sure that you ask about that if you're thinking about offering a new AP course uh, so that you can be able to support kids, particularly those who are low income that may be in your building, who uh, the cost has been prohibitive for them to take an AP exam. Um, computer science principles does meet a graduation requirement for mathematics, science, and computer computer science. So I know that you guys um, are with the changes around computer science requirements in your state. Some of you are looking for new compu computer science opportunities. Computer science principles is a phenomenal uh, entry level course that you may think about having at your campus. Um, and it can be taught by somebody who's not necessarily computer science, uh, but is maybe math or science or even English. If you have a dynamic teacher who's interested in, in getting into that uh, kind of content, do share that with them. I also wanted to note uh, our seminar and research courses, if you're not familiar with Capstone, and I know some of your schools do offer it, but if you're not familiar with our AP Capstone courses, those do, are allowable for kids. If they participate in that, uh, they are able to, to uh, not take, and it substitutes out the college and career readiness course that is required for all graduates. So that's a great opportunity. Plus the seminar and research courses are just an outstanding AP course that really is a little kind of different than the others. Um, there also was an endorsement change. You can check out that information online. It really just opened up the opportunity for more teachers to teach more AP courses and for schools to, to uh, offer things to kids. Now that was a lot, but those are the reasons why you want to be able to uh, know what the, is the opportunities that are there, explain to kids why the PSAT is important to them, uh, the SAT suite as a whole, and, and be able to answer their questions. Why would I take this? Why do I want it to, to sit for a three hour exam? That, that's what's there because the, in reality, the connection that's made around advancing uh, the student's um, success comes first from introducing them to opportunity. So it's really important uh, that you do that, that you not close doors to kids and, or make assumptions and say like, well, we offered it to everybody. Well, you know, maybe they didn't come to you because they didn't know that they could take it for free. So $16 seemed like it seemed or $18 sounded really expensive to them. So they didn't know to come to you and say, well, I, I, I can take it for free. So just empowering all of the kids that are on your campus to make good decisions um, and, and to experience that success. Um, outside of, of National Merit and Scholarships, I wanted to, to talk about a, a, a few um, of our recognition programs. Um, uh, several of these are going to be uh, really uh, helpful for your kids that you are serving, your populations that are there. Uh, the African American uh, uh, Student Recognition Program, the Hispanic Student Recognition Program, the Indigenous Student Recognition Program, as well as the Rural Student Recognition. Those are accolades that students can put on their college admissions exams, and they really are about targeting certain populations who are underrepresented. So making sure that you guys know that those exist. We also have scholarships, which is, are at the top of each of those recognition programs. So your, your kids can qualify both for recognition, um, which doesn't necessarily entail a, um, a, a scholarship, uh, but does allow, again, if students are in search, it allows for campuses to reach out to them and say, hey, you are, uh, we're recognized by, by this um, program. We would love to have you on our campus and we think you'd be a good fit for our uh, for a scholarship that we offer on our campus, so it can still connect them to opportunities on the campus level. Uh, we also do have scholarship partners that we connect with with uh, with each of these programs. You can check out psat.org slash recognition. Those are programs that that again, a lot of you might not be familiar with beyond uh, national merit as our scholarship partners. We have tons of scholarship partners, um, which I will. Um, will uh, share with you just in a bit, but uh, there are, are truly a lot of different targeted audiences where kids can qualify. Um, Big Future is a resource, especially if you're a new counselor. If you're not familiar with it, you should check it out. Big Future um, gives a lot of, of free resources to kids to be able to do things like search for the right college fit to see uh, student videos uh, of kids that may look like them or, or who went to college on a non-traditional path, who are confused about the FAFSA. They don't know how they're going to pay for college. There are a lot of resources on uh, Big Future, so I would encourage you to check it out if you haven't already. Uh, the college fit is awesome. Uh, you know, your kids may want to either go to Ole Miss or Mississippi State. That may be the only two colleges they've ever heard of. Um, 
But if they go in and they answer questions about the right college fit, they answer some questions about things that are important to them, things that like it may be services that are available on campus or religious affiliations or about, you know, dorm life or things like that. As they answer questions, it will tailor their list uh, specifically to the questions that they answer. So even if they don't even know where to start with college planning, Big Future is a resource that I cannot uh, celebrate enough, and the resources are all free. So make sure that you're sharing that with your students. If you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you guys to check it out um, just immediately. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal resource. Um, I mentioned a student search service. I, I just wanted to reemphasize it because it takes... Um, Whereas our assessments allow kids to, to uh, establish a score and to see about their college readiness, student search service really is sort of like throwing your hand in the air to, to uh, a, a campus to say, hey, I want you to tell me about your, your campus. I want you to recruit me. I want to be connected to you. And that's really important for our kids who um, maybe don't have the, the, uh, the good fortune of being able to visit campuses. A lot of campuses may be uh, you know, not allowing students to visit. It may be cost prohibitive. So a student search service allows kids to be connected to campuses um, as well as to connect to some of our scholarship programs to say, yes, we, this kid did meet your, your requirements. You should reach out to them. Um, and again, this is a benefit for kids. It is 100% voluntary, but I just wanted to make sure to explain to you why it's important to share with kids. Our kids will post everything on, on Snapchat or more likely TikTok these days, uh, but they get weird whenever they are, um, they're asked this question because they don't understand why. And so this is something that you, um, you may want to talk to them about. Um, we have also allowed it to be to opt in online. So if your kids don't participate in the PSAT or the SAT opportunities, uh, the kids can still go online to studentsearch.collegeboard.org and they can opt in that way or opt out that way. So it's a really fast and easy way for them. We've made it much, much more streamlined um, for our for students to participate in this program. Um, uh, another resource on, on Big Future is the college comparisons. Now, this is, um, I, I've chosen three campuses that I'm interested in, in attending. I can see information about each, and I can see it uh, three colleges at a time about comparing what, what it is that uh, these campuses offer. It shares with me if it's considered somewhat selective or less selective about, uh, about scores. Um, if, you if your kid is opting to share their, their SAT or ACT scores, or if they're opting to not, if it's required. It will share what the median score is for that campus. It will talk about things down to, you know, dorms are not available or you have to have a private meal plan or things like that just to be able to see each of these campuses side by side. It's really, really helpful, especially if you've used that college search resource and you've gotten it narrowed down to a few and you want to see comparatively uh, maybe what the tuition difference between the two. Um, you also see this add to my college list. That's a really, really important piece um, for, uh, for kids as they are um, building their college list and exploring what uh, campuses they might want to check out. It also qualifies them for a scholarship uh, that's called the College Opportunity Scholarship, which I'll mention in just a second. Um, Big Future has tons of resources around helping to pay for college and helping to find financial aid resources. Um, and, and so it is connecting them to the, the possibility of school. I didn't complete the FAFSA, which is hard for me to believe as, a, as an adult, but especially in an organization where we talk about it so much, but I didn't know that I was supposed to. My parents didn't know that I was supposed to. So uh, cost was always a concern. So do check that out. Um, the resources are there for kids. Um, again, I mentioned all of our scholarship partners um, National Merit, we've been partners with them forever, and we have introduced all of these other scholarship partners uh, that are available to kids uh, that are both in 10th and 11th grade in a lot of cases. Um, so National Merit is a huge, uh, a huge part of why the PSAT is taken, but not the only reason why. So you can find out more information there on psat.org uh, slash scholarships and see the requirements for each one of those programs. I also want to talk to you about um, a scholarship a search tool, which is new, um, newer for us. It was introduced last October, um, and it uh, allows kids, particularly kids who um, don't, again, know where to begin, um, if they participate in the, the PSAT, uh, they can use this as a, a place to uh, connect to their College Board account, which they'll build to get their scores. But also, if they're just exploring scholarships, uh, they will be able to go in, share a little bit of information about themselves, and then they'll see um, 
all of the scholarships that they're available. All of our partners are included there, but also thousands that come from the scholarship registry, um, the national scholarship registries, um, so that kids can see if they qualify, but also the due dates and a direct link for them to go apply. So making sure that kids know about this, this resources is free to you as well as a part of Big Future. Check this out. If you haven't seen it, um, it really is, is, is a phenomenal uh, resource and it's new. So some of you may not have seen it over the, the last crazy year. Um, the, the last thing that I wanted to share with you is a scholarship that's available um, around uh, opportunity, and that's about college uh, readiness. And this is a great tie-in with, with our friends at Get to College who help with, with getting kids into college and opening the doors. And, and, and this scholarship does not require a certain GPA. It does not require certain test scores. It does not require um, uh, even... Um, an essay or anything that's generally thought of that a scholarship requires. This one is just about getting ready for college. It's the things that they should be doing already. So there are six steps um, that the Opportunity Scholarship asks of kids. If you look at these, building a college list that I just talked about in Big Future, uh, practicing for the SAT, which is the Khan Academy practice, exploring scholarship using our scholarship search tool, strengthening your college list, which means going back and revising your, your, your college list that you built and including some safety schools as, where, as well as some match or reach schools, um, completing the FAFSA, uh, and, and then ultimately applying for scholarships. By completing all of those steps, which we all know are the steps that kids need to take in getting to, to college readiness. They're uh, eligible for college scholarships. That's really, really easy. It's things that your kids are already doing. If they complete all six of these steps, um, the first three are, are available for juniors and the second three are available for seniors. So it, it really spans the same time that you're talking to them about going through these steps. They're um, they're eligible for scholarships. And this is really, if they complete all six of these, then they're eligible for 25. Uh, we have $40,000 scholarships. I would love to see Mississippi student win one of those. We have not seen that yet. Um, right now, last year, five students in Mississippi were awarded $4,500 in scholarships. This comes back to exactly what we talked about earlier, and that's, that is knowing opportunity and knowing that it's available for kids and having them sign up. So I talked about again this a great deal in the in the webinar that I shared the link to yesterday. Be on the lookout for uh, for more information on this. This is a huge opportunity for kids. Um, as the student that's here who is a student um, from Mississippi who won one of the scholarships last year as he shared, it was a counselor who introduced him to that. So we I do want to make sure you know about it so that you can share it with your students. Can't say enough good things about the College Board Opportunity Scholarships, or CBOS as we call it. So do check that out. There's a counselor pledge page um, that, that we encourage all of you to go and take the pledge because your students that are in buildings where you, you take the pledge and you receive all of these resources that are available to you, uh, your kids are more likely to participate in, in uh, the CBOS program. So check it out. You're doing this stuff with them anyway, and we'll send you a lot of resources to help you uh, make it easier on you. If you have any questions, um, I have not been keeping up with the Q and A. Um, I've been talking a lot. We had a few minutes. I know we're uh, a few minutes before the, the the end of our session together. I wanted to share just a few resources with you. Um, the PSAT coordinator helpline or really just the counselor helpline. If, if, if you have any questions about anything, uh, you're welcome to reach out there. You also, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Kirsten and Shannon in a second to ask me any questions that have come through uh, in the Q&A. Um, if you have students who want to ask questions, their helpline is a different number. So I wanted to share that with you. But if you also are somebody that is connected to AP or SAT and you wanna send students to the appropriate helpline, the account help uh, for all College Board programs is listed there, that phone number. Um, also, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to me um, if, if you do have questions. A lot of times I'm going to send you back to the State Department or to your district leaders because they may have a different answer than me, but I'm always happy to help uh, as I am able to. So I appreciate your time today. I hope that you're all doing well, and let's turn it over to some of the questions that might have come in. All right, Kale. So we haven't had any questions that have come okay. through so far, but um, just a reminder to our participants, use the Q&A feature at the bottom and Kale can answer those live um, for you. I know, Kale, I, um, I was writing all pages of notes. And so I really appreciate sharing this information. I've starred several things that I'm like, oh, we really need to reshare this on newsletters and in conversations with educators and students across the state. And 
I love the data points that you shared. Those are going to be really informative. And then we've actually got a webinar coming up of how can educators make um, free data and know what's out there and make informed decisions to help their students in post-secondary. So I'm going to add some of these things that you've shared today um, to that webinar in the future to make sure that everybody is aware of what all is out there because there's so much that they may not be aware of. And I think that that was a lot of um, this morning's information. So it was extremely informative for me and I know the rest of our participants felt that same way. So I'm going to be monitoring the Q&A and I'll let Shannon kind of wrap us up. If there's any other questions that come in, I'll let y'all know. Yes, thank you so much, Kale. Um, uh, as a person who used to not love data, I was very interested in your data piece. That is super awesome. And like Kirsten said, I think that's going to be a great piece that we can use as well. Um, so many thanks today uh, for joining us. Uh, as Kirsten said earlier, we will email you the recording for this webinar in the next couple of days, and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. We would appreciate it if you would complete the short survey that will automatically pop up at the end of this meeting. Please fill this out um, and give us any feedback, honest feedback on today's webinar so that we can keep improving. All right. So today, I know many of you joined us, sorry, last semester um, for Topic Tuesdays, and we thought that we would keep that rolling for the 2021 uh, or 21-22 school year. So we will break these topic Tuesdays up into uh, the fall semester and spring semester. So for our next topic Tuesday, uh, that topic Tuesday will be held on Tuesday, September the 14th. And during that webinar, we'll be hearing from Jennifer Rogers at the State Financial Aid Office about updates on the state financial aid application. And then the Get to College staff will present to you any new FAFSA updates. So I know most of you love the FAFSA like Get to College does. So we're excited to bring you these updates on September 14th. As I said, we will continue this webinar series throughout the fall. We'll have one a month. If, you'll, if you participate in all five webinars for the fall, you will have the opportunity to apply for 0.5 CEUs. And then we'll also have that Spring Topic Tuesday series with additional CEU opportunities. And all of that information is on our website as well. These remaining fall webinars will include topics such as how to support undocumented students, NCAA Clearinghouse and Counselor Portal Explained, and information about Phi Theta Kappa International Honor Society. So we hope you'll be able to join us for those. You can register for these webinars on our Get to College website. They are listed under the Educator tab and then choose Professional Development. While you're there registering, please check out all the other resources for you and your students listed under that Educator, uh, educator tab. And I'm going to go over just a few of those very quickly. Um, so some of the upcoming uh, virtual training opportunities we'll have, and, and yes, they are all going to be virtual for this fall semester. Um, at the end of September, on Tuesday, September 8th, uh, Kirsten and I, along with State Office of Financial Aid, uh, will also be doing um, a uh, FAFSA and Mississippi Aid application update as well. Probably will be similar to what we're doing on September 14th. But if you have other educators who can't join September 14th, have them sign up for September the 28th, um, and that'll be at 10 a.m. Also, we have one more FAFSA training. It's our two and a half hour FAFSA training, and that's going to be on Monday, October 4th. And we are doing this particular uh, um, one in the afternoon, 1 to 3.30, and you will have opportunities for CEUs. Something new that we've added this year is the College Access Educator Training. We'll be having those on November 10th and another one in the spring semester on January 19th. Um, so that's a new training opportunity that we're excited about. And then some of you and, and some of your colleagues may be interested in the ACT Instructor Training. We will have four different dates for that and additional CE, CEU opportunities are available for that. So those are going to be September 7, 8, 9, and 10. So a big week of ACT instructor training. Again, you can register for all these on our website under the professional development opportunities. Also, uh, for any of, of you who are teaching CCR college and career readiness classes, or if you'd like to pass this on to your CCR teachers, uh, Kirsten and some others will be conducting CCR teacher chats 
just a time where folks get together to discuss what's working, what's not working, um, maybe just a little time to vent or figure out what's going on. Um, those will be happening once a month, generally towards the end of the month, but you can see those dates there and all those will take place after school hours, 3.30 to 4.15. And again, folks can register online for that. So that is all the training opportunities we wanted to highlight. So we hope you'll go check those out. Um, on the screen now, you are seeing our, um, our contact information for all three of our offices. Uh, I see one or two little dots coming up on the chat. Kirsten, are we seeing any questions before we end? No, just appreciation to the presenters and Kale shared his contact information to attendees. Great. So we will, um, we're almost at 11 o'clock, so we will sign off and we hope to see you all again uh, for our next topic Tuesday on September 14th. We hope everybody has a great day. See you next time.